Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. My name's Deborah Hatswell and you're listening to BBR Investigations. Tonight I'd like to share with you some accounts from some of the oldest Bigfoot researchers and investigators of the UK wild man here on this island. I often see videos now on YouTube and TikTok, you know, where people are out in the wild investigating at a location, or, you know, or just unlucky in the site that they choose for the night. It's a growing trend and not one I like, if I'm honest. These videos range from people not really used to the outdoors, reporting natural and human activity, sounds that happen often in a rural setting all the way through to complete, let's be honest, fabrication of views. In my time here at BBR, I've seen YouTube channels literally fake a Bigfoot structure at the back of their tent just for clicks and likes. And I wouldn't do that to my subscribers and I wouldn't expect you to accept that from me. But little is known of the people who set out in the days before apps and Wi-Fi and the internet were even a thing. Their experiences happened privately, they're ongoing, and they wouldn't be shared in a group setting for many years to come. For the majority of these men and women are out in the wilds. They are camping in the remotest of areas when they experience something that sets them on the path of investigation. And in some cases that can take decades. One of the best researchers here in the UK He's a chap that I will refer to as JC. I first met him in 2012 when I joined the original BBR group for the very first time. I was absolutely overjoyed when I found it. There were so many British witnesses chatting about their experience in a private setting. It was just like a breath of fresh air for me. It was back in the day when we'd be looking for anything that stood out unusual in the woodlands. Many of JC's finds were similar to my own, and he's amassed a great deal of knowledge on the subject of the British wildman. He has multiple captures of these creatures in his natural setting. In a recent video, you see a flur image of a figure moving. When finding an anomaly, he always goes back, takes a comparison shot, and often videos the areas he visits, and that's what he did with the flare capture. He also takes size comparison images, never edits, crops, or embellishes his content in any way. As I said, I believe he is amongst the top echelon when it comes to researchers here in the UK. His knowledge of the woodlands is far better than mine. JC is incredibly private, and to be honest, Getting him to share with me what happened in Hamsterley Forest was like pulling teeth. He's also very thorough and over the decades he has eliminated any natural animal or human sign that he finds in the woodlands and he can now tune into the very intricate clues left behind by our wild man as they move through the area. He's also studied many ancient languages, runes, uh, the Vinca language, Ogham, to try and match the glyphs that he finds, and he's been able to do that. He's very well acquainted with their etiquette, what is acceptable in their home areas and what is not, and he learned that the hard way. As I say, this all started in Hamsterley Forest for JC, when he was wild camping with several friends. JC is local to Northumberland. He lives in a beautiful part of the world, tucked up against the Scottish border. It has a vast and varied hunting and outdoor culture still. People still live in the old ways. There are small, tiny hamlets and villages that haven't changed much over the years. Farmers talk about strange animal kills, figures on their land, or cattle that vanish overnight. Hamsterley Forest covers around 5,000 acres. The forest is managed now by the Forestry of England and it's full of walking and cycling trails. But if you go off the trail, it is dense. In the heart of the forest is a privately owned property called The Grove, which was once a hunting lodge. And a local tale tells of a phantom horse and rider, which has been seen and heard galloping to The Grove. And the face of the rider is reputed to be covered in blood. Now, many believe that uh, the Rose reports are that of a highwayman. However, the Surtees family who owned the hall did have a horse riding tragedy between nearby Raby Castle and Hamsterley Forest. 
In 1803, Crozier Surtees was found dead in the river after riding back from a banquet at the castle. It was believed he fell from his horse while drunk and froze to death in the river. Other rumours say he was in flight in the forest from something chasing his horse. I guess we'll never know. But I do know there's more than one scary encounter that's happened there. I saw the Hamsterly Wildman, 1998. Witness JC. Many years ago now, myself and two mates were camping in Hamsterly Forest, which is situated in the northeast of England. It's something we did often, and with permission from the ranger, as we always left the area in the same way that we found it. On this trip, we camped in a field just a ways off from the ranger's hut. We'd set up our camp and wound and went about enjoying the day. We had a few beers and by about 11pm we decided to go for a walk to get some air before bed. We all went off together and walked for no more than about 20 minutes when things started to get weird. We were spooked by the sudden noise of branches being broken as we walked along the trail and off to the side of us in the bushes we could hear something moving along with us and you could hear the sound of breaking branches and limbs. We are used to the outdoors and we'd not heard anything this big before. So to be honest, we were spooked. We all ran back to camp. We jumped in the tent, zipped up and spent a very nervous night tossing and turning. But thankfully, nothing else happened. The next two nights were completely silent and I managed to get some sleep. Apart from one strange experience, when I realised something was being rubbed on our tent from the outside. While it was happening, we all stayed put in the tent and none of us went to investigate. We were all still thinking about the branches snapping on the trail and on the first night and wondering if this was the same animal and if so, why? On our fourth night, we were all sound asleep when bang, something whacked our tent hard. Without thinking clearly as I was sound asleep, I jumped up on autopilot and went outside as fast as I could. I was a bit annoyed, to be honest, and ready to have a go at whoever was out there messing about. I thought it was just other campers, but in hindsight, I had not seen anyone out there with us the whole four days. It was a full moon that night, so I could see about 20 yards all around me quite clearly. And there, walking away from us, in front of me, was this huge, almost human figure. This thing was about seven to eight feet tall. And as it went off, it wasn't running away from us. It was walking away at a natural pace. It wasn't scared or intimidated in any way. I could see it was wider and much taller than anyone or anything I've ever seen in my life before. It was thick and bulky across the shoulders and covered in hair everywhere. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I kept my eyes on it, whatever it was, it was walking off from me and I could see it had a very dark brown, almost black silhouette. I'm a big bloke and Amanda, but I was scared. I went back into that tent quickly and my mates tried to ask me what I saw out there. But I was speechless for about 10 minutes. My mind was reeling. Then all I could say was, we need to get out of here. And they just ribbed me, tried to explain it away. I just left it at that and kept quiet. We stayed in the tent until morning, which was not easy for me. I was shaking with fear for what was left of the night. My mate said, it could just be the ranger, but I knew it wasn't. The next morning, we went to see the ranger on duty that day, and he said he'd not been back there or knew of anyone else who was camping, and no one else was on duty that night. That was one of the scariest nights of my life, and it took me over 10 years to go back into the woods again and even now after what I've seen I'm reluctant to stay out overnight in the woods put yourself in this position you've got several handy lads from the northeast of England and not really scared of anything that are so spooked on a night out that he never goes back I know him and I know how hard it was for him to get back out there when you see a YouTube video or something on TV and people are out in the woods, that's lit for shot. So 
you've got like head torches on and you've got big bright lights and they do all of that so that you can see the scene within the woodland. When you turn those lights off, you cannot see your hand in front of your face. That's how dark it is. It's pitch black. There are noises, echoes, shadows, rustling, twig snapping, and you have to force yourself to endure it and push on. It's more than hard. It's absolutely fatiguing because you worry about going back every day until you go back. But the urge to find answers starts to outweigh that fear and that worry, but it doesn't take the fears away. Eventually, though, like most of us witnesses, the need to know what you saw starts to outweigh all that. And as far as I know, JC has never stayed overnight anywhere since that night. But over time, he's trained himself to go back into the woodland. He took hundreds of tiny steps to do this, and he's had many scares over the years. JC worked out a route running across the northeast of England, across the border into Scotland. He pinpointed a number of choke points on that route and he started to watch those woods weekly for years and years. He was often joined by other investigators and friends looking for their own answers. And whilst doing this, JC picked up on an area of high activity. He also began to stay out longer and longer and was beginning to feel like he could eventually camp out again at some point. In context, JC was a member of the British Bigfoot research team, along with Bigfoot Tony, Stu Hill, myself and several others, Charmaine Fraser, Adam Bird, and several other well-known UK pioneers in the field. None of us were experiencing anything dangerous at that point, so you do begin to feel a bit more emboldened. Like me, I'd set my camp stove at first, I'd have a quick brew, then back in the car. And eventually, we'd set up the biver and I'd stay for two or three cuppers. One night, I nodded off in the tent and that helped me overcome my camping fears. JC was not so lucky. And his fight between fear and knowledge is still ongoing. In 2014, he had an experience that stopped him going back into the woods for about eight months. Um, he said, during a research night, Deb, up near Healy Woods, we had something happen that I'm struggling to get my head round. I had a few people with me that night and we arrived and started to research around dusk. We parked up in the car park and set off on a walk in. And as I've explained over the last few weeks, I've had to clear some obstacles to get into this area. And the feeling of the place has changed since I was last there. In the last few visits, I've heard whistles and strange noises as if I'm being followed when I'm in there. I feel like I'm constantly watched and in winter, I found these strange prints in the snow. We were there for around an hour or so. Everything was quiet, with nothing really to report. So we started to walk back in the direction we'd come from. Without thinking, we're all dressed in camo, had a fair bit of equipment on us, and we're here much later than normal. We had green lasers out, and we're shining them in the trees as we made our way back to the car. As I said, it'd been silent until we turned to head back at which point we heard a noise and I shone a torch in that direction and there was nothing for a second and then all hell broke loose. We had clearly disturbed something with the light beam and whatever it was started to crash through the dense trees and it was coming in our direction. As it ran, it was snapping and breaking limbs as it went. It was throwing them in our direction we headed back into the area the crashes were coming from, as we had to go back that way. I got about 10 feet onto the track and a big stick hit the tree I was next to with a loud bang. And it had definitely been thrown at us. It didn't come down. It came across the trees about my head height. We headed a bit further, a bit more cautiously now. We could still hear it moving around us, snapping branches just ahead of us. Then it got worse, much worse, as we heard a loud, chesty grunt. I know my animals, Deb, and it definitely wasn't a deer. It sounded much bigger and heavier. It stopped us all in our tracks, and we decided we'd have to go back and try and lose it and try and find another track out of here. As we were walking back, 
at the side of us, we felt as though something was paralleling us through the brush. It was shadowing us out of those woods, but we couldn't see anything as it was too dark. We got back to the path, left the area a bit shaken, but also a bit excited. It took a lot for me to go back, but when I did, I wish that I hadn't. That experience happened at the end of July 2014, and in August, a week later, they went back, and JC said. We went back to the area a week later to look for evidence of what happened to us that night. In the area where we were bluff-charged by a large animal, there was a lot of disturbance on the ground. But there was no clear prints as we just had heavy rains the day before we all came out. So we decided to search a different area and see if we could pick up a trail, but we had no luck. After a while, we decided to walk back to that area where we'd been the week before, as it was getting dark. We came around the bend and nipped into the woods off the trail. When we were about 20 yards in, I just happened to turn around and I saw a dark figure run past between the trees. It was all black in colour from waist to head. I could see it fairly well. It wasn't clothing that it had on and it seemed to glide past as it moved. There was no sign of the up and down movement that humans make when running. The head on this thing stayed at the same height throughout. We came out of there, back onto the path quickly, and I'd say it took maybe 10 to 15 seconds, and you could clearly see down the path about 250 yards, but there was no sign of anything. There was just nothing there. We packed up and left. Now, JC and his team visited several areas over the next few months until things came to a head in August of 2015. Myself and a small team decided to visit the old mining land at Weirdale, again on a research outing and a wild camp, as there are a number of Bigfoot accounts in the area. We arrived at Killope about 4pm. I was interested to return here as the last time we were out, we heard the sound of a woman screaming loudly in the woods. We parked the car, went into the tree line. We were about halfway in. We came to a trail that had been blocked by falling trees. We set about clearing it and it was hard work moving them. We pushed on through the blockade. And as we entered the thicker part of the wood, we heard a very loud, sharp wood knock. I didn't realise it at the time but that was probably a warning knock. We pushed on as it was really hard going and we went further and further into a small gorge. And as we tried to go through, we realized the only way in was blocked and hidden by falling trees. The whole entrance was non visible. If you didn't know the forest well, you would not know the trail was there. At this point, we turned around and left. As we skirted the area, we heard another loud wood knock coming from a different direction from the gorge side of the woods. We carried on up to the dam at the top. It started to rain, so we all headed back to the car to get our waterproofs on, as we planned on staying later than normal. We decided, as we couldn't get into the gorge, we'd go for a walk around the perimeter. But as we got to the top of the hill, we heard the unmistakable sound of a few branches snapping and breaking. At the time, we shrugged it off and put it down to animals and carried on walking around. It took us ages and nothing more happened. So we changed course and decided to go through the dense trees and try and get into the gorge that way. It was very creepy and everything looked exactly the same. It'd be really easy to get turned around in there. But luckily, I had my GPS on. Otherwise, I would have gotten lost. We came out onto a path, walking back the way we tried earlier. I don't know why, but I shined the torch behind us quickly in a sweeping motion, and I saw a dark figure shoot past. It moved very fast across the path. Again, I just put it down to animals. It was getting late, so we went back to the tent as we were getting hungry. So we wanted to get set up and I was going to get the barbecue out and set up the tent and all the gear. It was at that point we heard a noise similar to before. So this time my mate shone his torch at the trees. And there, in the light, just standing there, was a dark figure. It was about seven feet tall. 
it was half hiding itself behind one of the trees. He turned the light off for a second, turned it back on, and it had moved position. It had crouched down really low behind the fence this time. He quickly turned the light off again and then on, and it had gone. There was nothing to see and no noise of it moving away. The figure was all black in colour and massive in size. The lads with me were spooked and so was I. They wouldn't go back into the woods and I agreed with them. We sat down around the fire and all was quiet for a while, but then it started to get really creepy. The atmosphere just changed completely. At this point, we heard a strange chinking noise and we realised something was tossing small stones at us, one or two every now and again, and then we heard footsteps coming towards us. But they stopped when I shone the light in that direction. Nothing was there. This went on and off for a few hours, over and over. So we finally decided we'd have to get up and go and investigate what was throwing the stones at the camp. We looked with torches on full beam in the tree line and bushes, but we couldn't find or see anything. The noises and activity didn't stop when we got up to look around. We could still hear the footsteps and more pebbles and small stones were being thrown at us. At one point, the stones hit me in the face. A few just missed my face on a couple of other times, but I couldn't see what was throwing them at me. We were spooked by all of this. It felt like we were being pushed back to the area where we parked, pushed out of that forest by something we couldn't see. So without thinking about it, we went back to the car, at which point the footsteps started again, coming up to us, but you couldn't see what was making them. So we jumped in, got ready to drive off, and as I did, something we couldn't see began to shake the car violently with us in it. The back end of the car was being shaken up and down, as if something we couldn't see had hold of it and was hefting it up and down, and pushing it from side to side. We couldn't do anything other than look at each other, then look all about to see what was happening. It was utter confusion, but there was nothing there that we could see. When the shaking stopped, we'd all had enough. And we just got out of there. I'll go back to the area at some point in the daytime, but not at night. It's not a place people should go alone at night. Can you imagine being in that position? You're out there in the pitch black and something is throwing stones at you to the point that they're hitting you in the face. You don't want to get up, but you've got to get up because at some point you've got to go back to that car anyway. And you take comfort in numbers is you and your mates but what do you do in a situation where you are chased back to the car park and into the car and then the next thing your car begins to shake can you imagine what that must have felt like for them you know that's how strong the urge to know is it sick feeling or not you've got to go back into that wood and start searching again and it takes some minerals to do that believe me now this is just a fraction of the interaction that jc's had he's still out there and no matter how many times he's terrified in the woodlands he finds a way to get back in there and try again he's matched me in his thirst for knowledge on this subject he wants answers and he's found many on his journey his knowledge is gold and should be shared, and his message too. He also says, be very wary when you're out researching, and that's the number one thing he would advise. He has a YouTube channel, and I will add the link in the description below. He has some amazing evidence finds. JC sent me a video he'd taken recently, where he found a footprint, and at the time he remembers hearing a noise, but it was on listening back at home, he realised it was a growl. He's got many audio clips and he'd love to be able to share them with anyone who thinks he can bring out the audio on some of his clips. He also has a host of images and videos where he captures some truly awesome evidence finds that I think you'll find as exciting as I do. 
if you want to do some analysis on these, feel free to get in touch with me. Over the years, people have reported their own scary experiences, many akin to the one JC and his team have had on their investigations. Stu Hill had an experience in his research area. He had a couple, and I'd like to feature some of his experiences in a future podcast. Damien Fellwanderer from um, Harwood area. He also has had some strange things happening to him out there in the woodlands and has some amazing evidence finds. So over the next few months, I'd like to bring more of the British Bigfoot subject back to the channel because I really enjoy it. And showing you some of the early pioneers, I think will give people a real insight to the work that's been done prior to this becoming a household name now and it's wonderful that it's a household name now but we need to look at the evidence and the knowledge that these guys have and we have to tap into that and make future investigators one man who wasn't out there to hunt bigfoot or cryptids of any kind was looking for wildcats here in the uk he contacted me in 2015 about an experience he'd had in the Chilterns whilst trying to bait in a large cat. This happened in May of 2017. Hi Deborah, I've followed your page etc for a while now and to be honest I've always found Bigfoot in the UK a bit of a push to believe but I'm open-minded and I'm quite well known in big cat research in the southeast of England. I've camped out in many places overnight and spent days out in the woods in search of Britain's large cats. I know the diverse habitats in the UK, and I understand how large, intelligent animals can stay hidden from people and thrive quite easily. I'm used to bushcrafting, nature structures, and even I'm finding things I can't explain. Like the night in question, I'm not claiming it was a wild man or a cat. I don't know what it was. I'm simply stating some very strange things happened that night that I cannot explain. I was camping in the Chilterns in Mantles Wood near Missenden, Buckinghamshire. I lived very close to there and I actually found a sighting of a hominid about a mile away that happened 20 odd years ago. Do you have any sightings from the Chilterns, Deb? I'm curious because about five months ago I had a very scary experience while solo camping over some bay I'd set up in the valley. I was trying to lure in and film some big cats. I'd set all this up earlier and I was just waiting in the hopes of getting something to come in. I'd settled down at camp by the fire and I was sitting really quietly when I noticed I wasn't alone anymore. At first I only sensed it. I picked up that something was near me. But after a while, it seemed like there was something that would be approaching me, perhaps 20 metres or so from me, and then go back again. I could hear the breaking sticks and the ground movement. I actually thought something was throwing things in my direction a few times. It really sounded like something was throwing branches to get my attention. And whatever it was, it stayed out of sight of the fire. There were no lights on. And when I'd shine my torch to the area I thought the sticks were coming from, nothing could be seen. It was very strange. And I thought at first somebody was having me on. It's a long walk there and back for a prank. But I was certain someone was there. I'd actually shout out to it. And then I'd bark, do my best dog impression. I think I thought it was poachers or something. These twigs were not coming from down, they were coming at us. I eventually it all stopped and went quiet, so I settled down for the night. Later that night I fell asleep and I heard a huge bang and a crash. I thought it was a gunshot, but thinking about it now, I think it was a tree limb being whacked against a tree. I got up, ran out of there. I went back to get my stuff the next day. The camp was fine. Nothing was touched. I don't know what was going on. That is the same experience that JC and his friends had. A massive bang or a wood knock, you know, feeling that something's around your camp that you're picking up on. These experiences match many that I've recorded here in the UK that feature an unknown creature or animal that remains out with a firelight throughout the event they often throw small stones, pebbles or rocks, pine cones, sticks and branches will come flying at you. Whilst doing that, they remain hidden. That must be a scary experience. But can you imagine waking up encircled by a fire all around your camp? 
This happened to a man while camping in Hounslow in the 1990s. Matt Evans. What is it about wild camping in tents in wooded areas? When I was younger, about 18, I was with a few friends camping on Hounslow Heath and we heard footsteps walking around our tent many times during the night. And whenever one of us would look outside with a flashlight, there was never anything there. But we all heard the footsteps and the time taken to quickly unzip the tent and peek outside wasn't sufficient enough for whoever or whatever it was to disappear that quickly. But they did. Anyway, we fell asleep. We woke up a couple of hours later to a ring of fire surrounding our tent. I'm talking about a perfect circle of fire with our tent being right in the centre of it. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there and ran home. Luckily, we were all from Hounslow. We went to one of our houses and stayed there for the rest of the night. We left everything behind at camp. We went back to get our belongings during the next day. Sure enough, we got back to the tent and there was a black circle around the tent where the fire had burned the grass. I'm perfectly satisfied that it wasn't the work of kids. We hadn't told anyone, not even our parents, where we were going that night. And every one of us, there was four of us in total, heard the footsteps but saw nothing upon inspection. I know one thing, if I know nothing else, and that's that camping out in wooded areas at night time is a very bad idea. I've never been back since. For our last case tonight, we're going to go over the border into Scotland and the close to Grindstone Law and Hungry Law. There's an area, a place known as Spit Hole Bother. It's like a stone hut where you go. Um, and it was set up back in the day, for, obviously, for shepherds and things like that. But now it's used by walkers and hikers, wild campers, climbers, you know, the whole nine yards. In 2014, I got a report from a chap who's always out. He stayed in every single buffet that's out there. And he was telling me about an experience he had with some of his friends when he stayed over. And he said, hi, Deb. I stayed at Spithope Buffet with three mates while we were there. We saw lights that looked like the headlights of an approaching vehicle. But they couldn't be. You can't drive a car up there. But then, as they got closer, they turned into one light somehow. So we thought maybe it was a helicopter, but there was no noise to it. We'd walked in from the road and set up for the night. We were sat there listening to a football match with the top half of the boffy door open. Myself and my mate saw the lights as they came closer and grew in size. It was completely silent, so it wasn't even a drone or anything like that. We even questioned if it was a torch or a headlamp, but that didn't fit with the movement either. Then it started to change colours, and it was a spectrum of them, moving very fast in a sort of pie chart visual. And then the light began making very fast triangular movements. Two of us that were there that night are believers of this type of thing, and two are not. You can imagine the crap our brains were coming out with, but whilst looking for explanations to what that light could be, it wasn't an ATV or a head torch. It was white at first, until the colours changed, but it didn't light up anything around itself. It didn't light up the ground. There was no illumination coming from it. I've had interaction with lights in the sky since I was younger. But this one was the worst one yet. In the daylight, myself and my mate went to look to see if there were any signs of vehicles and we found a strange pattern of grass near the buffet, almost like it had been blown down from above. It was a strange night all round. After seeing the light, two of my mates refused to even talk about it. They acted as if the whole event didn't happen. We were all asleep and silent by 10pm and I don't remember anything other than listening to the football match and then seeing the light. Four grown men in a small buffet make for a fair bit of noise and none of us made a sound all night long. I'm a keen wild camper and I have been my entire life. Both myself and my mates are used to the outdoors 
and we've camped at lots of boffies on both sides of the borders. On two occasions, I've heard a strange, whoosh, a huffy noise that's really deep, like the test they used to check your lung function. One of those times I had a mate with me, and he heard it too. We shot back into the boffer as soon as he heard it. When I was speaking with Thomas, I asked if any of his family members had experienced any strange lights or paranormal events, and he said yeah, and that his grandfather, like mine, was a merchant seaman. And when Tommy was little, he gave him two books. One was a survival book, and the second, his grandfather explained that he wouldn't understand that book until he got much older. That book was Chariot of the Gods. Next week, I'll be sharing with you some similar experiences that also involve some of our long-term British Bigfoot and UK wildman witnesses who set out to find their answers as I did. In those, I will be including any photographs, footprint finds, facial images that are in the BBR Facebook groups that I think you will enjoy seeing. I haven't done a lot of work on the British Bigfoot recently because I've been spread so thin, but obviously I absolutely love it. And it's my area of expertise, so to say. And I've got a lot of knowledge like these guys that I'd like to pass on. So over the next few weeks, I'll be bringing you quite a few things on British Bigfoot. So if you're not tuning into the channel for that, I, I apologise, but I will still be doing all of the other subjects as well. It's just it's come to that time with me being off work now that I'm actually out of time to do this. I wanted to do this for a very long time. There are a lot of evidence finds that are in private collections here in the UK that have just simply never been shared because the, some of the people don't have social media. I mean, there are still people like that in the world. Um, I only have social media because I share my work there and people find me through that. And I'd like to share some of that evidence going forward with you all. Um, so you can see it as well. Um, there's a lot of American stuff and Canadian stuff and things like that out there. There's a lot of British stuff too and the Brits are really into the subject now. They're really interested in it. So I'll be bringing you um, as much as that as I can. I'm going to go through JC's work and I'm going to pull out some video clips and put them into a compilation for you so you can see them. This footprints is a video of him having things thrown at him. There's the audio of growls, actual speaking voices and chatter. Um, quite a few things. He's had some strange things happen to him over the years. And he's not one for hype. So he's never hyped his channel or anything like that. It's just a place where he stores his evidence, like the map is where I store mine. Um, and I'd like to get that out there to the public. So check out the description below because the link to his channel is there. Like I say, I'll be sharing some of his evidence with you guys going forward. Um, and I think as we go forward in the future, I'll be able to show you that the UK is not behind the ball when it comes to Bigfoot research. In fact, some of our investigators have the best evidence I've ever seen. And I can't wait to share that with you. So until next time, good night, everyone.